All right, welcome back, guys. So this is going to be a pretty big episode. We've got an interview coming up with the one and only Jamie Soward. It's pretty heavy hitting. He puts it forward a lot of opinions, and it was bloody fun to do. How you been, Jared? Uh, yeah, good. Unfortunately, I wasn't actually able to make that meeting. I was people still have to work, so I was stuck in work while Adam was having a great conversation. I worked before and after that really hard, <laughs> but it was a, it was an awesome um, way to spend the middle of the day. I'll tell you that. Yeah, uh, no, I've already actually seen listened to the podcast, guys. It's one of the better ones. It's really, really good. Yeah, out of the two interviews that we've done, it's definitely in the top two. Yeah, no, so, I, I, definitely up there. Definitely up there. But basically, because it goes for a little bit of time, we're only going to do a quick intro uh, today. We're just going to touch on the main talking points with regards to the proposed starting date of the NRL and then all of the TV deal news that's been coming through. Um, and after the interview, we'll just do a quick uh, update on what's coming up uh, through the week and into next week's show. So, who wants to kick this one off? Oh, we can start on how Channel 9 have been kicked in the ass of the way they've been acting. Really? Um, so, what's come out, though, they were very... They, they were really considering not even letting NRL play this year. Yeah. But now, since, uh, what is it, $250 million from a London firm or a bunch of London banks <clears throat> coming together and the NRL has secured a bit of a funding there. What's it, $100 million cash? 100, million 100 million up front with $150 million in reserves. Yeah, so... and, um, and then on top of that, there's been rumours going around and they are unconfirmed, but it is out there that Channel 7 are looking at Find the rights if Channel Seven, if Channel Nine, shit the pot, which would be a massive. Where do you two. come up with these sayings? <laughs> you love them. Um, massive coup for Channel Seven because what does that mean if maybe they won't get the money out of it this year, but in the long term future, if they treat the NRL right, well, what will they have? They'll have the AFL, cricket, Wimbledon. Um, not Wimbledon. Yeah, Wimbledon. Uh, Wimbledon, uh, Australian Open, they'll have that as well. Olympics Anything when it else? comes back on. Olympics. So they're going to have the rights, the exclusive rights to 99% of the sport in Australia. And Channel 10's which, got the golf, I'm pretty sure. So yeah, so um, Channel 9. This week that golf's going which, to be probably the first sport getting back up and running. Yeah, so Channel 9 had the crowning jewel as far as we're concerned, rugby league. The, maybe not in Victoria. But and so if Channel 9 keep this hard stance, then maybe they'll lose, what, $130 million this year if they play NRL, which is what they're worried about. Mm -hmm. But if they aren't prepared to lose that and think 10 years down the future, this is going to be a big deal, like a massive shift in an Australian sporting landscape where when you think about it, if Channel 7 gets all the live sport, including State of Origin in the finals... Bye bye, Channel Nine. Really, ching, ching. what are they going to have? Like, what, what what do they have now other than sport? I don't even know. I don't know. I don't watch any free to air. Yeah, but not other than rugby league, of course. All right. But so, yeah. <laughs> just to try and tie all this together, we put forward basically a uh, time frame or timeline of what's going on. So, NRL came out on the and proposed their start date of the twenty eighth of May. And then we talked about how they had hurdles and stuff they had to overcome, one of it being the actual schedule and TV rights. Um, Channel 9, not so keen on that because basically, like Jared said, if they continued the season from now on, looking at the 15 rounds that was first proposed, Channel 9 stood to lose $130 million. So they basically wanted to stall as long as possible so there's less content to put on. So there's a higher chance of no NRL this year, which wouldn't want obviously work then for Fox Sports or the NRL. In the first meeting, they've come out and said they want exclusive rights to the Friday and the Sunday games. So no Fox Sports being involved at all. And they also wanted the removal of the uh, 6 p.m. game on the Friday night. So they'd have the exclusive Friday night only game because they know how much the viewership um, shifts because there's two games rather than one. Fox Sports want the schedule to remain the same. They want the same 
um, access to all matches, even though Channel 9 said, if we have the Friday night, you can have the Thursday night. Anyway, so this is pretty much the aggressive approach that Channel 9 said. It's either you give us these or we're going to pull our support for this year and we're not going to have a showcase. And, then, and NRL was not in a great spot then. Then this Oakwell group, Oakwell advisory group from the UK came forward with $250 million, $100 million up front, $150 in reserves. Now, each season, the NRL gets $300 million from Fox Sports and Channel 9 combined. So for an advisory group to come forward and put up $250 million, it pretty much covers both companies put together. So it puts the NRL in a good position, puts NRL, uh, Channel 9 in the, on the back foot. Once that came out, then we started hearing these whispers of Channel 7 going, well, if the NRL's got this money in the bank, Channel 9 kind of doesn't have the same leg to stand on. If we can sniff around here and say, look, we can put this up with the Olympics being postponed till next year, Wimbledon being cancelled, um, AFL still up in the air, Channel 7's got some money to play with. Um, that's it's, been pretty cool. And then this American consortium, Jared found out, he's done some research last night. This It's called Park Lane. Um, basically what they do, and it looks pretty uh, pretty cool, is... Oh, it's going to change the landscape of rugby league if it comes, if it comes in. Yes, it most definitely will. So this Park Lane group, I'm just going back to our research here. I'm trying to get the wording right. So there you go. They're a firm specialising in assisting high net worth individuals become owners of sporting franchises. So basically these guys help rich people own NFL, NBA, NHL, MLB clubs. And they've come to the NRL saying, look, we've got a hell of a lot of money. Um, how about we come in there and purchase part of the NRL to help you get your cash flow back on track, which sounds very much like private ownership of clubs. You keep reading along, they're more interested in buying the entire league. Blandies have come out and said that they're not going to give up this majority share, but a minority stake could be in the offing, offering. So that's a lot of stuff that goes yeah. went on in the last week. Where does that leave us right now? Tuesday, uh, we've got the uh, commission meeting, so AR ARLC, Australian Rugby League Commission meeting. So that's Vlandis, Peter Beattie, Megan Davis, Wayne Pierce, who's the head of the Apollo uh, Project and Apollo. Greg Weiss. Greg, Greg Weiss. Weiss. And Tony McGrath. They'll be discussing the American Consortium proposal and the London investment to look at how much money they will have going forward. That's going to happen on Tuesday. Then on Wednesday, uh, is the Project Apollo meeting. So Jared said that Wayne Pierce will have a whole bunch of paperwork to take to the thing saying, look, we're still starting on blah and blah. This is how many weeks it's going to be. This is what the schedule is going to look like. And this is how much money yeah. we've got. I imagine by <gasps> Thursday, we're going to have a lot of information. But I was just thinking about the whole Channel, Channel 7, Channel 9, Fox Sports thing. Channel 9 have been kind of when you think about it, very lax in the last oh, probably five, six years now to entry in the NRL. So their approach to it has been less is more. So obviously they've had less games in Fox Sports, but they've had the state of origin and exclusive finals. rights to finals. Oh, so, grand final. Yeah, so they've, they've been very... Because of that, they've always had the crown jewel of rugby league. They'd be very relaxed. Like the Fox Sports have been coming up behind them with better shows, better broadcasting, more raw more wide range of um, commentators and expert opinions. Despite the fact, Yeah, despite the fact people don't like certain personalities on there, they've got a lot of ex-players and stuff. Like Channel 9, their crown jewel has probably been the footy Bit show. With Johns. Them. Yeah, it's gone. Footy show's gone. Yeah. Um, they fired oh. Matty Johns, which was a big deal because he's probably the leading man in Fox oh, yeah. Rugby League right now. Yeah. So I think they've been a bit silly the last maybe 10 years of how they treated rugby league and this has kind of brought it all to light and the fact that rugby league don't have any money anymore or well, they didn't two weeks ago and now they do it's kind of put them in a really bad spot of how they've acted this whole situation so it's going to be really interesting what happens to channel nine now if they don't 
well, not pull their head in, but start really thinking about what they're doing because their show, their their coverage hasn't been as good recently, and the Fox what footy show is gone now. So like, and you got Matty John show on Fox. You've got the games with no ads, that sort of stuff. But also, yeah, NRL three hundred and sixty. Um, Fox sales also pr- the other one that's struggling as well. Like their numbers are dropping a lot because of all the streaming service and stuff doing so well, yeah. especially at the moment. So yes. if they can come out of this with something yeah. extra or one less competitor, that's going to be huge. So this meeting on yeah. Tuesday <laughs> literally has the potential to change the entire rugby league landscape, not just with broadcasting, but could be even off seas, uh, overseas uh, consortium or companies <laughs> um, having some form of controlling rights over our game. Yeah. Now, if Philandis, sorry, I just dropped my pen. If Philandis is correct in saying they'll have a minority stake, it's more just cash flow, but it could open the opportunity to private ownership of clubs down the track. Yeah, well, see, that's the thing. Like, um, rugby league, there's always a team that come out probably once every three years and say they're bankrupt. And so you got someone who has a minority stake in the NRL and might go, oh, I've got a, like, um, Ten million dollars sitting there. I can bail them out. NRL are going to jump on that chance. So it's a it's a foot in the door, which could, could become completely wide open eventually. So could you yeah, look at um, Forbes two weeks ago? I think a week and a half ago. They always announced like the the value ship of sports teams, and you had the Yankees came in at five billion dollars. So you're looking at one sporting team in the state. So obviously the biggest baseball team in the world, but worth $5 billion of one team. So the people that are involved in this Park Lane stuff, they're used to companies worth billions of dollars. Like, not companies, sorry, but teams, one team. Now, when you've got one team worth more than the entire game, it's going to (laughs) be damn interesting to see what's going to happen. I like the look of this $250 million from the London Consortium. So basically, it gives the NRL a bit more of a bargaining chip to channel on yeah. saying, if you pull out, we've got this money in cash reserve. If you want to taste the court, we can use it there as well if we need to. Yeah. yeah. And it's not like, like Pete like said, it's not like NRL don't have our options right now. So it's just, it's going to be damn interesting to see what happens on yeah. Tuesday, Tuesday and yeah. Wednesday, especially Thursday when everything gets consolidated and put together, it's going to be really Huge. get on the news and see what happens. All right. Uh, yeah. Guys, we're going to wrap up there on that topic um after the soured interview that we're about to go into uh we'll give you an update on what the show is going to look like moving forward so here's the interview with jamie really hope see you guys bye all right guys so this is our interview with jamie soured unfortunately jared can't be with us today he's working uh, but we've got jamie on the line hey mate how you doing? Yeah, I'm good. I'm uh, looking forward to this. I've been doing a fair few uh, interviews and podcasts and stuff. I think everyone's got the podcast bug, but uh, yeah. looking forward to I like the fact that everyone can come up with different questions. So hopefully we get a little bit weird this afternoon. Yeah, I think we will. Um, so we said before the show, I've got a couple of cousins in Sydney um, who have thrown through some questions. We've got a mate who's a diehard Dragons fan and you're definitely one of his favourite players. So he's sent through a couple and then we've got kind of our banker questions as well so i just want to throw it straight off the bat um you definitely seen as one of the unique characters when you were playing and post post career as well so a bit different that sort of stuff um one thing that jumped out to me was i had a bit of reading i think you were jumping between the roosters to dragons and you did it on a handshake agreement and you said always handshakes before contracts yeah, it was. Um, I, I worked like that my whole career, pretty much. So I, when I left Canberra, I moved up to the Roosters, and uh, before I'd sort of signed the contract, I'd you know just moved up, uh, handshake deal, and then got the contract afterwards. And then when I left to go to the Dragons, it was uh, I actually played first grade that week before for the Roosters, and went to Wagga for my one of my best mates' uh, fathers had passed away, so. Um, you know, the, the word had come through that I was going to sign with the Dragons and uh, the Roosters rang and said, you know, we want you to stay. And I'd already said that I'd hand, uh, handshake deal with Nathan Brown that if they could make it work, I was going to come across to the Dragons. So, um, yeah, I was pretty 
adamant like that. Same thing happened when I went to Penrith. You know, the Sharks uh, rang me the night before and uh, I was about to sign and I'd, I'd already hand uh, shake deal with, with Gitrill Gould. And, yeah, it was, I don't know, I was just brought up that way that, you know, your, your handshake and your word is, is what you judge by. And um, regardless of everything else that I've gone through in my life, I could always say that I um, honoured those handshake deals and I, it worked out for me. That's awesome. So it's definitely something well, I think a lot of us grow up uh, doing, but in the professional sporting world, it's yeah, not something that really um, you hear about considering yeah, all the transfer process media and stuff. It's like, yeah, it came down to a handshake. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah, it was, I mean, for me, even you know, when I re-signed at the Dragons, yeah, it was, you know, Wayne rang me uh, in 09 and said, this is the deal, take it or leave it. And uh, I just said, yeah, sweet whatever yeah cool. get it done and then when i re-signed at the end of that deal again uh, before i left the dragons it was just yeah i, I didn't really contracts for me were always going to take care of themselves and yeah. um, no matter what people outside in terms of having worked both sides media it's our job to speculate uh, what the person's on and you know all that kind of stuff because that's what drives the the engine for the nrl to keep getting you know multi-billion dollar deals yeah but for me, I never saw it like that. I just saw it as if I was playing good, I was going to get a contract. Uh, and when it came to crunch, you know, I'd, I'd like to get it done as quick as possible versus drag it out. And I was never big enough to drag it out anyway. I wasn't a, a real big name in terms of um, a star recruit or anything like that. I just like to get it done and, and get to work. A couple of things you said in there, like I had for later in the interview, but when you said from seeing it from both points of view, media and a player, um, you've made a couple of comments that, um, you felt as a player, the media might criticise you and didn't get as much respect maybe for some of the things you did in the playing career. But now you see it from the media point of view and you see why they do it or how they do it. Has that yeah, kind of... It's, it's a tough one because early on, I've always wanted to work in the media. And yeah. early on, I probably had worked out the media game before my time and before mm. I'd actually done anything in the game. So I kind of demanded that respect early on that I probably hadn't done enough in the game to have that um, clout behind me. So that clap, you know, yeah. be able to have that sort of stuff behind me. So when I went to the media, um, I try and just call it straight down the line. And some players don't like it. You know, Aiden C's last year called me out on a live show that he thought I'd been harsh on him all year and it wasn't personal. It's never personal with me. Yeah. You know, it's never, if, people, if people don't like me, I don't care. But how I call the game and how I judge players is that performance inside that, you know, the four white lines for 80 minutes. And, you know, that I felt like at times throughout my career that I was being judged by my personality versus what I was actually doing on the field. And, you know, if you look back to those three years, 09, 10, 11, mm. um, 09 especially, you know, I, I don't think I got enough respect for how good the team was playing, what I was doing inside the team uh, and, and personally how my season was going coming from nowhere in 08 you know didn't play a finals game to 09 you know up there for the Dally M pretty much all year so uh, I, that was I felt disrespected but I always I also played that up a bit because I wanted the chip on my shoulder so um, yeah moving to the media now I, I see the transition is hard but uh, a lot of those people that probably gave me a hard time now didn't understand my character I'm an emotional person uh, I like taking the piss out of myself so a lot of those times I felt like I was ahead of the game and, um, you yeah, know, those people didn't understand me. But now they work with me and they understand that I'm the exact same as I was back then. I just know yeah. how to work it a little bit better. That's, re that's like, refreshingly honest. Like, a player, ex-player, like, calling themselves out, saying, this is what I thought then in hindsight. I might have been ahead of myself, but in other ways, I'm going to stick true to my word and, and that they're my beliefs and that's what I'm going to follow through on. That's awesome. Yeah, well, it's in Australia, we... Everyone, there's heroes and villains. You know, yeah, every great superhero has a villain that, that they go up against, and not everyone can be the great guy that you want to have a beer with. Yeah, you know, unfortunately, yeah. for all the listeners, the kids, and stuff like that, if you have one lesson, not everyone has to be that person. That you a great guy. Um, you, you know, we spoke off here about James Maloney, polarizing figure, but is a winner. And yeah. at the end of the day, yes. you're judged on whether you win or lose. So. Um, for me, I didn't mind playing the villain. I still don't mind playing the villain. I think that uh, my social media and my opinions are my own and, and people don't agree with them. And that's that's great. That's what makes, as long as you do it respectfully, I think that can make really good uh, content and conversation and stuff like that. But um, I don't mind 
having a beer by myself. I don't have to be the center of attention. And I think a lot of people get caught up in that. They change the way that they perceive themselves and, and present themselves to try and be that nice guy because every Aussie wants, oh, I, want, I want to have a beer yeah. with that guy. You can't just talk yourself up. And, you know, the other example of that is recently I picked on my podcast, I picked my greatest ever St. George of the Warra side. I saw that. And the, the question I asked was, should you be able to put yourself in the side? Now, not not necessarily my own opinion, but yeah, because I, I felt like Anthony Mundine was the best 5'8 that St. George Illawarra had had in that short time. Trent Barrett, very close. And, and then I would consider myself probably third. But when a guy like Cameron Smith has to pick the greatest ever the Melbourne side, are you telling me he's not going to put himself in the side? But if he did that, he'd be classed as a wanker, right? So, Is that what Heinmar um, said? I'm not going to put myself in my team. I'd exactly be a dickhead. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. So that's the whole, everyone, you know, there's, we all want, there's a, a, an aspect of everyone that we all, all want to be liked. But, you know, sometimes if you just call it how you see it, the small minority might respect it. But I think that's been actually, you know, true to, to what yourself and how your character is. Yeah, so just be yourself and if, people like you for who you are, then they'll be uh, more loyal and long time friends than those who are pretending to be. I don't need any more friends. I've got my wife and, and daughter. And your daughter. And, yeah. uh, another one on the way. So, mate, oh, I, congratulations. I, I give, yeah, thanks. I couldn't give a toss about more, having more friends. Um, <laughs> I care about them and, and the work and, and yeah, my, my tight circle has always been my tight circle. It hasn't yeah. changed for you know, 20 odd years. So, um, yeah, I, I don't really, yeah, I think if you, if you have, if you're comfortable within yourself and you have your, your tight group, the rest of it just you just let it go. Beauty. Um, I've got a couple of things we'll come back to with regards to that. But talking about your um, uh, individual uh, individual aspects, basically the goal kicking always comes up, and and that was from a session with Graham Arnold. Is that correct? You were working on goal kicking with him before he was the Australian football coach, and um, you said you kicked him at about seventy percent from then on so not the best but definitely not the worst but the actual routine was that part of that session with graham arnold no nah, I, I don't know how the routine started it was just one of those things i think it was about yeah. getting my body moving uh into the ball and putting my foot closer to the footy uh, and going through it um yeah unfortunately my percentages took a huge hit when brett morris scored i think 50 odd tries in out on the years, wing so. <laughs> out on the wing so um that was always tough but yeah goal kicking is one of those things that i teach kids now and you've got to want to do it and I, I didn't want to do it early on from an early age and sort of got talked into it because no one else wanted to and then worked hard at it and you know you're doing maybe three thousand kicks uh, potentially for 150 kicks throughout the year you know it's a lot of work and a lot of discipline so um the run up just happened to come about the, the session with Graham Arnold changed my goal kicking uh, career, you know, trajectory in terms of 70% was, you know, not many guys kick above 80. Um, yeah. So, and especially if, you know, a lot of those times you're, you're in the playmaking role and all that kind of stuff, you've got, you've got everything going on. So um, I was happy with how I kicked the ball. I could have probably kicked a little bit better here and there, but um, that session after Graham Arnold at Cogra, just me, him and Kurt Wrigley really changed the trajectory of what I thought about goal kicking angles. I found myself um, concentrating and you know, practicing a lot better after that session about angles and through the ball and all that kind of stuff, stuff that I'd worked with Craig Fitzgibbon and Daryl Halligan on and that I never really probably quite connected uh, as I did with that one session. And then after that, when I worked with uh, Chook again out of Penrith, a lot of those things were already in place that had been in place for years. So I sort of understood them a lot better. Uh, but Graham Arnold was fantastic. And you, you're comparing then with um, Fitzgibbon and Halley, and they had a lot more um, curve on the ball. Whereas yours was just that straight through at the straight trajectory, end over end, that sort of stuff. Yeah. So when you're saying the angles, is that talking about when you're actually lining it up on the tee as opposed to the angle of your leg coming through the ball? Or a bit of both. Um, no, it's more angles of shoulders and you know, oh, you put cool. the ball on the tee. The run up or the run up for me was always the same. So four yeah. back, three to the side, uh, turn around, march, whatever else uh, happened. But the angles of where your shoulders are, because you're trying to get through the ball uh, as best as you can without changing motion from where you are in the field. So uh, for instance, if I was on the right hand side of the field, left foot kicker, 
my shoulders had to be square with the ball to be able to go straight through like that. If I was just a little bit off, uh, you could see I never wanted to hook the ball to the left, uh, to the right-hand post. I wanted to always push that left upright. So yeah. uh, for me, I'd always concentrate on the left screw between the crossbar and where the post is. Every footy post has it, the screw to join. And if yeah, I yeah. focus there, all I was thinking was left upright, left upright, because uh, for me, I, was, I didn't want to curl the ball back in, but I knew that I could get through that so that if I did miss right, um, I was thinking that left way. You never wanted to see a goal, a left foot kicker hook to the right hand side of the post. That's really cool. So it's much more like planes of motion and biomechanics rather than a specific routine. And you're saying inside the left post, that's actually, we're doing a bit of research around Jared Croker, what everyone's asking what he says before he kicks it. Yeah. He says, that's what he's saying inside the left post, inside the left post. Yep. That's what he says. Yeah, cool. Um, and also just the running out on the field at the start. I know that was something <laughs> that fans. We kind of love you for it or hated it. The whole run out, jump up and down, pump yourself up. I yeah. never saw it either way. You were never on one of the teams that I supported, but my mate, who he loved it. He loved the fact that you were running out there, just pumping the crowd up, pumping yourself up. Again, something yeah. that just you did from a kid. At, at, uh, like you did that um, all growing up, or was it once you got to the NRL, uh, you had that atmosphere uh, and the adrenaline and all that sort of stuff? Yeah, just I don't pumping know. out the cheeks, um, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. It was probably a little bit of um, showmanship, I would say. Because I love, like, uh, but, guys, I can see Jamie on the video and he had, like, a bit of a cheeky <laughs> smile on before he started answering this <laughs> one. He's like, yeah, yeah that's um, what I did. Yeah, it was, it was a bit, probably a bit of showmanship. I don't know when it started, actually, but uh, I carried it through probably when Wayne came through. It was a way to get my nervous energy out um, oh, cool. before, before a ball was kicked. Uh, you know, I was quite uh, footy-orientated for... You know, a lot, a lot of my life, especially, you know, through the first grade, you know, just concentrated on footy. I didn't have many hobbies or anything like that. So uh, a lot of everything went into to winning or losing on a, on a Sunday or whenever we played. So getting my nervous energy was out of the way. But I, I just loved, um, it, by the end of it, uh, there were some nights where I probably gave a little bit extra just because I knew that we are playing in a hostile environment. And uh, I enjoyed, weirdly enough, I enjoyed people booing me because I knew that... Um, Either way that night, they were going to talk about me, whether they'd run over me uh, and their team had made me look stupid, uh, yeah. even though I'd tried my ass off, or I'd broken their hearts. And uh, I'm lucky enough to say that, you know, apart from Melbourne and, and probably one or two other teams, uh, I'd, I'd had a couple of heartbreaking moments against yeah. the, the rest of the competition. So uh, that was pretty cool. Would Greg Inglis be one of those? Oh, mate. The, <laughs> yeah, the GI. You don't need to go into that one. Oh, I don't really care. Like people, uh, I still see people today and they're like, oh, you know, people on Twitter say, oh, remember when GI ran over you? Of course I do. It was the first game of the year, 09, five minutes into the season, you know, GI drifted GI across. GI and I've seen it. But, um, I never, you know, I never really dwelled on that moment. He got me no. once again at Cogra, but I was like, what, what would you expect me to do? I tried, you know, and yeah. um, it was it was one of those moments in my life where I look back and I think, yeah, sure. I could have gone low. I could have done a million other things, but you know, we all make mistakes. We all you know, make bad decisions. Uh, for me, it was how we bounce back. And, and what people don't realize is, you know, we score a try with a minute to go in that game, uh, you know, nine, and I've got a kick from near the sideline to tie it, to send it into golden point. Now, if I had carried that first, yeah, involvement of 2009 being pushed off by GI for the rest of the season. I wouldn't have had the season I had, and I wouldn't have been able to come up with that kick. So, um, that's I don't an really awesome care. piece of advice. Yeah, I don't really care what people um, say about yeah. that because the people that comment on it uh, are the people that have watched it and probably never played. And it's an easy out for an NRL player or an athlete to say you've never played. But I think what people don't like is the fact that I call them out on it. Yeah. And uh, that's where they start getting a little bit pissy. You know, they, they want the reaction. They get the reaction they don't like. And then they start getting upset about it. So, uh, but yeah, I, I think if you look back at that game, you know, coming up with that clutch kick. And Wayne never, ever made me feel bad for my defense on GI. Um, and, and, I, you know, I never, ever felt bad. I was always cautious of trying to get my body in front. And that was my job. But my job wasn't to make 50 tackles. My job was to, for other things in the team. Yeah, and Inglis's job was to run at the half, regardless of what team he was playing. 
Exactly and, right. <laughs> that's it. I coach um, some high school footy and mainly girls actually, and um, them more so now have grown up playing footy, but a lot of them don't grow up playing footy and just teaching them how to tackle. And if they do come up against a bigger opposition, we call it the ugly tackle. Literally just get the body in front, get your head out of the way and do as best you can because it means you've put your body there to start with. If you'd stepped aside and just let him run through, that was going to say a hell of a lot more because you actually put yourself there. Uh, how many people in the public would actually still put themselves in front of GI to put themselves in that position to start with? So well, it makes not, that's a big yeah. thing with regards to your, like, just character. The fact that you tried is something that the knowledgeable NRL and rugby league community to respect. Yeah, and... You know, when you look at the statistics of, you know, Phil Gould sat us down at Penrith one day and uh, just, I hadn't played a game yet. And he talked about all the players that had played in NRL. There was 10,300 and something that yeah, yeah. have ever played NRL. And um, he spoke about that, you know, 30% of those guys had played one game or, or less yeah. than 10 games or something like that. So courage for me isn't me smashing Greg Inglis or, you know, courage for me is working my ass off for 20 years to get to that point, to put myself in a position to play NRL firstly, and then to be able to do it week after week for 12 years and play 200 games. That's, that's courageous. Yeah. I'm, I'm not the biggest guy. I'm not going to smash anyone, but um, you know, being able to put your body in front and prepare and be disciplined enough for that long uh, that's courageous. That's what discipline is about being courageous. It's not necessarily about being the toughest and smartest. And that's what I say to young kids, the, the wait for age debate and, and teaching kids how to tackle and all that kind of stuff is, well, you know, the smaller kids end up making all the money because they're the smartest. Yeah. Uh, they they play the, all the important positions, right? Uh, but if you get your body in front and try, no one will ever, ever knock you for trying. Yeah. Uh, it's the what you just said then, Adam, about getting out of the way. And, and sure, there's times where I, I would like to have changed my tackle technique, but there's other times where you know, I got smashed and knocked out yeah, is that courageous because I got knocked out? No, it's it's stupid. Yeah, it's stupid the fact that we look at it that way. So, yeah, I've always just thought that getting to first grade is is courageous enough, and being able to perform on the big stage that that was courageous. That's huge. I love that answer. That's so good. Um, just jumping into you mentioned Wagga Wagga was your junior club. You went. You're in the Raiders system. You moved to Sydney with the Roosters Jersey flag team, who were brilliant. Won the 2004 premiership with them. Um, on the back of two of your field goals and then jumping into the <laughs> Roosters side because that was after uh, Brad Fittler had retired and then kind of in and out of the team and then you did the handshake deal over to the Dragons and that's where we probably saw your best overall and best consistency of footy, especially 9 and 10. You get your Dally M medal in two th uh, Dally M 5-8 of the year, 2009, and the Proven Summons medal. Um, the questions we basically had around them was the turnover of 2008 to 2009 at the Dragons. So you had players kind of like um, Wendell Saylor had signed Jeremy Smith coming in, Darius Boyd, Costigan, Luke Prittis, Michael Wayman, and Bennett there as well. A uh, question I had from a couple of guys was, what made the biggest difference or was it a combination of things? Was it Bennett's influence, the influx of new players? to go from what was happening in 2008 to what happened in 2009 being minor premiers? Yeah, I think 2008, I mean, I'd only been there for a year and a half, but 2008, it's sort of, by the time Newt Wayne was coming, um, I wouldn't say it got stale, but, you know, Brownie had been there and sort of had his chance yeah. uh, to get those. Because he'd been there five. since, what, 08? Something like uh, that? He'd, oh, yeah, he'd, Brownie had been there since. Yeah. Yeah, 2003. So he sort of had the best squads, you know. And yeah. uh, the squad we had in 08, probably 09, 10, wasn't anywhere near that squad, those squads in 05. And, um, you know, when Wayne came to the club, it was the influx of new players, excitement. You know, we've got the greatest coach of all time. Um, we've got, you know, this renewed belief within each other that we may not be the most talented, uh, but we're going to be the fittest, you know, and everyone has that goal. But uh, we did a pre-season camp, came away with a lot of confidence. And I don't think we expected ourselves to be as good as what we were in 09. And, and you, I look back to that first game against Melbourne, we'd come off and we were bitterly disappointed that we'd lost the game and all that kind of stuff. And Wayne walked in the sheds and said, 
I feel sorry for you. And everyone sort of looked up and he said, I feel sorry for you that that's the standard you've set yourselves at game one. I thought it was going to take a long time. Yeah, not a long time, but I thought Longer. we're going to work up to that performance in six, seven weeks where we get that performance and we think, right, we're a gritty team. We're going to, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but we'd gotten to it in game one. So we'd sort of surprised him and, and surprised ourselves. Uh, we beat the Sharks 10-6 a week later in an ugly win at Cogra, but after that, we started to roll. So I think it was a combination of everything. Wayne certainly had a majority to do with that. But, um, yeah, unlocking unlocking a person like myself, uh, you know, a conversation. It's after training one day, I probably hadn't trained my best, and he called me over and he just said, I want you to tell me five things you're good at. And I said, you know, being the guy, the humble guy that everyone wants to be, as I was talking about before, I'm not really sure. And he said, well, if you don't know what you're good at, then what are you doing here? So I gave him the five things that I was good at, which was, you know, I was fast and kick the ball and all that kind of stuff. And he said, right, we'll just work on that. Your defense, you know, we'll work out ways to get your defense mm-hmm. right. So, and, and you just work on what you're good at and what you can do for the team. You've got 17 guys every week believing that all they have to do is concentrate on themselves and do their part for the team. And I've, I've used it many times. It becomes like a conveyor belt. You know, your job is to put the, the left wheel on, on the car. Don't worry about the right back wheel. That's my job to do the left wheel. Someone else's job is to do the steering wheel. And everyone did that for, for two years, for three years pretty much. Um, and we ended up, you know, two minor premierships, a, a competition, a world club champion and three finals appearances. So um, it was certainly a turnaround of, I guess, belief and, and Wayne and, and players, but it all just worked together. That's the main thing I took out of that was the simplification. Yeah. Just considering how much like we go into statistics and patterns and um, game plans, etc. If you can simplify it down to one person, one role, that's way less well, to you, deal with. You, it, and you know, if you if we had if we come off a bad game, we came off a bad game and made twelve errors. Um, if and, and everyone thinks, well, I didn't make an error. You know, and someone else made one error. If everyone thinks they can make one error, that's 17 errors a week. If everyone thinks they can miss one tackle, that's 17 missed tackles before we get out on the field. So, you know, our thing was people are going to make mistakes. People are going to miss tackles. That's just the way it is. It's how we scrambled and responded to that and stayed in games. And plan A, you know, was our thing. If we got, if we stuck to plan A, we were going to win. But as soon as we started to change our game plan and got frustrated with each other, we didn't, we didn't even come close to playing like the game that we wanted to play. And we did that the first half of the grand final. And, and Wayne said, you know, that's not the Dragons out there. The Dragons that I know are ruthless, defensive, you know, stuff like that. And, and we came out and smashed them second half. Yeah. But um, it was the simplification of what had Wayne had brought to the club to be able to let players excel in their own environment without um, overcomplicating and making other people worry about other people's jobs. Well, at the end of that 2009 season, so you minor premiers, dominant like the majority of the season, and then knocked out of the finals two straight games. Mm. What was the, was there any, um, what was the aftermath of it firstly? So like literally post-match, but then over the, the break um, and then coming back to pre-season next year for your premiership year, was there emotional, mental scarring? What was the players' response, Wayne's response? Um, no, was, it Wayne, a, was it a shock? Yeah, no, Wayne, yeah, I spoke to Dean Young. Um, we, we, we did a documentary for NRL.com that'll be out. We thought it was going to be out this year, but probably later. Yeah, later, later in the year, maybe. Um, yeah, the, the message from Wayne, and it reminded me, because you forget a lot of things, obviously, but yeah, it was, we're not going to change anything. After we lost that game to Brisbane, we're not going to change anything. We just need to do what, we, what we've been doing better and at the right time of the year. So, uh, sure, disappointed. You know, I dreamt of holding up that trophy my whole life and to finish first and think we're going to run the comp here. And then we go bang, bang, we lose eighth at Cogra, which was embarrassing, 1v8 after beating him by 40 points a week before. Yeah. And then you go to Brisbane and uh, I think the, the devastation of losing at Cogra probably carried over into Brisbane and we're up against it up there. So, um, but 2010, we just, we came back and, you know, we trained the house down. We, we didn't change a thing. We just came back and did it all better. And it was about, we knew that 
we were good enough to get back to where we wanted to go was just being able to perform. I think the most nervous that I was wasn't the whole 2010 season. It was that first game against Manly in the quarterfinals at Cogra because, yeah, again, you know, 1v8. Um, they'd had a lot of injuries. They weren't expected to win, as he touches the managers, but they weren't <laughs> expected to win. They were, you know, up against it, and it was yeah. a tight game in the first half, and then we ran away with it. But, um, yeah, we we didn't change anything. We, we still went left with Darius and Brett Morris. We still kicked and chased, and we still defended our asses off. So um, the scarring, I think, was external versus yeah. internal. You know, oh, that's internal cool. motivation was was always to get back to that spot, but uh, the external pressure and media and all that shit was, was from outside. Yeah. As a Manly supporter, I hated playing you guys through those years because we'd won the premiership in 08 and um, 11, but I still don't remember beating you guys any time over at Wynn or Julia nah, or Cogger, any yeah. of them. It was like you were kind of like our bogey side, like Canberra ended up being for the Dragons for a few years. I was just oh, like, we yeah, just can't he... bloody beat the Dragons <laughs> over there. I was just like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Bloody hell. Yeah, it's always. Um, I was yeah, probably we, sitting there going, run it, see how it runs. <laughs> oh, mate, you joined everyone else. <laughs> um, so you go through then 2000 and um, uh, through 2010. And one of the other ones, I guess, one of the only real criticisms of the Dragons over 09 and 010 was you were a. And Melbourne Storm gets this as well through all their um, success, was you're a team, you're front runners. The only time you seem to struggle is if you fell behind in games. And then 2010, you were behind in the prelim final and then again behind in the grand final. Um, and I think you've already touched on what Bennett said. You weren't the Dragons in the first half. Was that the main uh, the main message? You're not playing like yourselves? Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know anyone that, yeah. I, again, this is the perception in the media. I don't know mm. anyone that doesn't like playing from in front. No, yeah. So, um, yeah I think the last what they might have saying is you're free flowing talent. Cowboys did it three or four years ago where they were the second half and they just put on like 30 points. Yeah, Pen points. Penrith's done it as well the last oh, yeah. couple of years. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the comeback kids, but you can't win competitions like that. It yeah. just, there, there's, because what happens is you tread a fine line of, yeah, we did it one week, we did it two weeks. Oh, wow, we're still doing it. Yeah, but everything needed to go right in those situations. You come up against a team that doesn't give you that and it's over. And that's why Penrith haven't been able to progress past the second week, mm -hmm. you know, three out of the last four years or something like that. So, um, yeah, of course, everyone likes being front runners. Um, yeah, we were criticised for how boring we were, taking the two, you know. Uh, up 6-0, you've had the ball for five minutes, you take two points. Like, we cared about winning. We didn't yeah, care winning. what the score was. We didn't care... Yeah, what you thought of it. We weren't out there to aesthetically please you uh, from a viewer's point of view. Dragons fans cared about winning. The players cared about winning. The coaches cared about winning. Uh, and that's why I was successful. Um, I don't think that any fan would care. Yeah, sure, you want to see plenty of points. Um, but if you're sacrificing those wins, fans wouldn't want you to do that. So, yeah. Um, yeah, the, the main message I always tell, I mean, Wayne come in, we're 8-6 down. The prelim final for me was the grand final. Uh, that's no disrespect to the Roosters or the Titans, but I felt like that was the main matchup yeah. that was going to decide that premiership that year. And in the first half, you know, um, Tigers, it was huge. I mean, 80,000 two weeks in a row for a kid that grew up in Wagga was unbelievable. But... Um, yeah, that, that prelim final was ebbs and flows, you know, momentum tight, not going to be a lot of points, you know, a lot of, it's going to come down to one or two plays and then, you know, that's what happens. Grand final was probably going to be a little bit more open once both teams settled down. Uh, the Roosters settled uh, a lot quicker than us. We scored first, but we probably didn't settle into our game. And then at halftime, you know, Wayne's chatting and stuff. And I remember him saying, you know, all we have to do is win the second half. And I, I near smirked. I've told that story many times because if we didn't win the second half, we weren't going to win. Yeah, so, you down 8-6. Um, yeah, 8-6 down. So, yeah, it's, again, the simplicity of Wayne's message. Um, you know, he went into other stuff there. But the simplicity to be able to settle his team down and say, you're not playing like Dragons. You boys, if we don't win the second half, we're not going to win. And, and that, you know, for, for a... A kid that you know had had all the pressure on him in the last yeah. two years, and you know this was his biggest day. Uh, it settled me right down, and and I always mention that first set after half time, we kick him behind BJ Leilua, who we kicked to exclusively that day, 
Uh, we got a good set. It rolled down about a metre out from the line and you just look up and there was 12. I think maybe even Darius was in there as well. We all chased that first kick like it was the start of the game. And from that point on, we didn't look like we we're going to be beat. Just like one, one last quick one on the uh, Dragon, so we can move to the second like part of your career. Um, was there any mention of it at that half time that the Roosters, because they were wooden spooners the year previous, and they were trying to become the first team to go from wooden spooners to premiership winners since freaking yeah. like the 30s or something? Was that touched on at all during the week? No. Nah. No. Nah. Cool. We could. We were the best team. Um, yeah, I remember. Because that would have been a media thing. Like, yeah, I think the. I think the, I don't know when the Dally M's were that year. Maybe it was a little bit earlier or, or the week before or something like that. But uh, Brian Coach had got, uh, Brian Smith had got Coach of the Year. Todd Carney got Dally M Player of the Year. And I remember we, us getting on the bus and we were filthy. Yeah. Like, absolutely filthy. You know, we'd finished first two years in a row, which was hard to do. Uh, Darius, yeah, in my eyes, won that Dally M medal well and truly before the season. And both seasons, you know, we finished, I think we lost three out of our last four or, or whatever, but, you know, Darius was outstanding at the back. That, and he, he got Clive Churchill, yeah? Final. Yeah, he got Clive yeah. Churchill, but yeah. he, he deserved that Dahlia medal. Dahlia and, well. uh, we were filthy that we didn't get more respect and for the hard work we'd done. Uh, you mentioned Brett Morris. I, I read this and I, you mentioned Brett Morris is your, um, I wouldn't say fav- well, favourite player, but the best player in their position that you've ever played with and one of the one of the best um, wingers of all time who's meant to like speed. The best. He's the, the best. best. That's awesome. Is there a... What's the way to put this? Uh, the word underrated used a lot, but was there a player, we'll say a whole career, who was working just as hard as everyone, was as important to the winning as anyone, um, but you felt maybe didn't get the kudos outside the club like it mattered anyway like he was valued mm. in the club but yeah. is there a player you'd be able to pinpoint um, yeah look just quickly on Brett yeah you know, 160 odd tries um, has done it for what <laughs> I mean nearly 15 years yeah that's that's the best winger of all time at every club care. he's been at yeah I don't care what anyone says uh, I'll, I'll put Brett Morris up against anyone so um, but guys like Jason Nightingale, you know, I picked my team. I had to leave him out. You know, probably didn't get enough credit uh, throughout his career. One guy that stood out was Ben Hornby. That that move from fullback to, to halfback. Um, it's a of weird course, move. Darren Lockyer, yeah, Darren, Darren Lockyer was celebrated um, to move to 5'8", and rightly so. One of the greatest players to ever play. Uh, but the, the move from Benny to move from fullback to halfback for our team so Darius could play there um, was enormous. And you know, for two years... We'd been criticised about. Well, we can't can't win a comp with Ben Hornby at halfback. No, it just won't work. Yeah, you know, uh, he him and Sal, the, the combination just won't work. It just won't work. And I remember Grand Final night saying that, you know, choke on that. You know, <laughs> Benny Hornby's a halfback. He was our captain. Now, I don't think he ever got enough credit um, for his, you know, willingness to be able to sacrifice, but also lead the team and come up with the big plays at the right time. And and you look back and. Some of those games, you know, the subtlety, especially in the grand final, um, the subtlety in which he went about his business, I don't think he ever got enough credit. Before the show, when I was talking to my cousin, the Dragon supporter, we actually compared you and Hornby, your partnership in the halves, to what we've seen um, what we've seen the last two years with Kronk and Kiri, where Kronk was the cool, calm, collected sort of experience head, and Kiri was the free-flowing, running, flashy setting up the tries, that sort of stuff. And I was like, that's very much how I remembered you playing, the running, the flash, the <laughs> one-hand dummy, the kicking. I don't, but... know who's, I don't know who's going to listen to this, but I'm not comparing ourselves to Kiri and Kronk. Don't worry about that. Um, with regards think... to the running 5-8 yeah. and, the, and the... like We saw what Kronk did in the grand final. He hardly touched the ball, but just being out yeah. there and organising and controlling and slowing things and then just letting Kiri just do his thing. I think Hornby played a similar role to that where he didn't have to be a man of the match performer all the time. And maybe that's yeah. what people were looking for because of how good he was at a full, as fullback. Yeah, I think Cooper, you know, the last two years has really shown how tactically brilliant he's been throughout mm-hmm. his career and, and how good an organiser he'd been. And if you remember back to the start of 2018, there was a lot of hands-on 
the ball from Cooper and trying to organise and stuff like that. And the Roosters struggled the first, I think they were three and four or four and three, yep. uh, the first eight games of the year. And then they played against Cronulla where he took a step back and Kiri dominated a possession that night and got Tedesco involved and they, they beat Cronulla easily. But um, that was, you know, that was a master stroke from Cooper and, and Trent to be able to get that together because Cooper realised that kiri has got all the skills. Uh, he just needs someone to put him in position. I think, mm. you know, a lot of the times the way we play the Dragons was, you know, when we went left, Benny was going to give the ball to Darius in the right position for Darius to come up with the play. And then if it came to the right-hand side, he was going to put me in position to be able to run and, and come up with a play. So, again, that's why he was underrated and not valued enough as a halfback for him putting himself in the right position to put the team in the right area to be able to come up with the right plays. And, you know, like I said, Darius um, came up with, 50 crisis in two years or something ridiculous like that. And uh, all those moments wouldn't have been able to happen if Benny wasn't leading and putting it in the right direction as per the Roosters with, with Cooper. So this is all the good stuff and then all good things come to an end. So uh, yep. Bennett leaves at the end of 2011. Mm-hmm. Um, before that, though, you've done the World Club Challenge. Um, you go there and beat Wigan. What was that like? Before Just before yeah, we move good. on to the... Um, yeah, moving to uh, Penrith and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, it was it was a whirlwind tour. I mean, we did it in eight days. We flew over. Um, yeah, I don't really know what to expect. We're playing against Wigan. Uh, I always felt like the Super League was ten years behind us. You know, in terms of their skill level and everything like that. And I mean, no one had ever left the NRL in their prime to go over and play in the Super League um, in their prime, sort of thing. Yeah. So uh, we just got off the plane, trained. You know, bounced in. It was a tough game. It was one of those environments that you'll never forget because the crowd's right on top of you. And, and we came away with the win. We celebrated in Hong Kong. It was a pretty good trip. <laughs> Love Can't it. Can't share too many stories from, no, from uh, honkers. <laughs> um, 2000, and then, yeah, so then Bennett Leeds goes to Newcastle. Um, you play another couple of seasons, the Dragons under Steve Price, and then it was kind of... Form form may have dipped, uh, different relationship, I guess, with the coach maybe is, mm-hmm. is, is pretty much what's released. And then um, you'll put back to New South Wales Cup. You signed a contract with Penrith starting the next season, but you weren't granted a release. So you took yeah, up an option was, with the London Broncos. Yeah, it was, um, you know, the relationship between Pricey and I when he was assistant coach was probably as tight as through those wow. three years. Um, when he'd moved to first grade coach, there was an unwillingness from, I guess, myself to want to change what had worked under Wayne. You know, there was a lot of uh, Pricey trying to put his own imprint on it. And I'm sure he'd agree that he handled some situations. I handled some situations. Um, you know, we had some off-field stuff going on. You know, I had some off-field stuff going on in my own personal life and all that kind of stuff that all led to that uh, moment of me being dropped. And you now I... I wanted a contract at the Dragons. I was filthy. I wasn't getting a contract uh, offer in 2013. So my form had started to dip. And um, yeah, I got offered one year. Penrith offered me four. I'd signed. And as soon as I signed, uh, I got dropped and not allowed to train with a full-time squad. And wow. it was just all that lead up. You know, and I've spoken about it before. And me and Pricey are sweet now. But yeah. I think uh, at that time, you know, he was a young coach trying to put his imprint on the NRL world and the squad. And We'd had an ageing squad who had been successful a certain way. And, you know, like I said, that unwillingness to change. And uh, I guess, you know, the boredom from me in what we were doing at some some things weren't getting results and stuff like that. So, um, you yeah, know, that all happened. Go to London, come back and, and you know, take up the four-year deal with Penrith. But, what, yeah, what, was playing with London, what was playing in London like? So actually playing in the um, Super League as opposed to World Club Challenge? Yeah, I, both times. I mean, I went twice. Both times I played with the worst club. Uh, yeah. Super League, you know, so not, not um, you know, in terms of worst club, but I mean, they were coming last. Or, yeah, yeah. Or in second division. So, uh, look, it was it was tough. You know, Penrith wanted to, didn't want me to go over there straight away because they were going good at the time. Um, you know, the, the expectations, if I come across and wreck that, then I'm there for four years. And, you know, it was a smart move by Penrith and, the Dragons sort of just wanted me out. So I've always felt disrespected that I never got enough respect from the Dragons at the mm-hmm. end of my career there and, you know, never got the lap of honour and all that kind of stuff that goes along with people that have won um, championship 
uh, with with the club and hopefully one day it happens but um, yeah that that's sort of always been a bit of sticking point for me and to to go to London twice it was good um, you know we got beat 70 odd nil in a semi-final yeah, on national it. TV which wasn't great but look I think you know the game over there is it's, it's different it's fast paced it's plenty of points it's you know, the, the powerhouses of the competition dominate. They've only had four winners of the Super League era. In, so that would be the NRL era uh, for us. They've only had four winners in the last 23 years, which has been Bradford, who are now in third division or second division, um, Leeds, Helens. Wigan and St. Helens. So um, that's why I think the competition over there is, you know, no, if we had a reserve grade team based over there, they'd be able to comfortably make the top five. Wow. It's... Um... Yeah, I was saying earlier before I can see your face on things, and it's we talked to um, Flanagan, I think, about the Super League and people going, oh, it's like, it'd be a great experience, family experience, and you're just like, I guess you didn't plan on going there at that stage, and it was kind of to be able to yeah, keep playing I mean, footy for the second half of the season or play um, yeah. reserve grade back home. So Well, I played reserve grade a couple of times, and it was... Mentally, I needed to get away. Mm. I needed to get out of that. I was in a toxic part of the relationship with the Dragons and I needed to escape to get over to England. So I did that. And then it was the same at Penrith. You know, when they'd said that it was time for me to move on, I wasn't going to sit around in reserve grade and play, um, you know, and fill out my contract year in 2017. Yeah. And I took a huge hit financially, but for my mental well-being to get away from that and then move on with my life, it's the best thing I've ever done. So uh, I think sometimes we get caught up in the decision that, oh, it's, you know, I have to play so I can get that money. Well, you, there's other ways you can make money. You yeah. just got to back yourself and, and look after yourself mentally. And, you know, when I left Penrith, I'd come off of a tough two years off field mentally uh, to get into that position. And then when I retired, so I'd done all that in three years uh, so mentally, I was ready to yeah, get out done. of the game and look yeah. for the next challenge. So in Penrith, like you um, had your back surgery, like three in six months. Um, yeah. When you came back, and you're saying the mental toll, um, I never played obviously anywhere <laughs> near as high, but I had an ACL uh, Rico when I was 17, and it took me till even my early 20s to get it out of the back of my head. Yeah, were you reserved when you came back? Was that part of the, the mental side of um, things? Or? Yeah, see, I'd, I mean, to 2015, I'd still dealt with a yeah, marriage breakup. So I was going through a divorce. Um, yeah, I was living by myself. So mentally, I probably wasn't in the best space. Then I hurt, you know, we start the year, we win uh, the first game against Newcastle, and I hurt my back, missed the second game, and then play the Titans. Uh, sorry, no, Bulldogs, sorry. We, we beat the Bulldogs at home. And we'd had that successful year in 2014. So we, we all thought it was our year. You know, I'd had mm. ankle uh, reconstruction in the off-season uh, to get a spur out and clean up. So I'd come back a little bit later in pre-season. Uh, we beat the Bulldogs. Uh, I lose feeling uh, in my left leg two oh, days shit. before. And then go out. And, and Ivan at the time, you know, thought I was not faking it, but didn't really care that I'd lost feeling in my left leg. Um, probably as much as I did. And like I've always said, if it was my right leg, I wouldn't have cared because I can function. You know, I just needed to be able to feel my foot and leg when I was kicking. Yeah. Um, I went out, you know, played. The next week, got needled in my foot. It was like someone was holding a match to the bottom of my foot uh, against the Titans. We beat them 40-odd nil, and uh, we'd sort of talk behind the scenes about, could I get through to round eight or nine? Uh, with the rep weekend and then could I get the surgery done and only be out six weeks that was the decision I had to make I went I wanted to keep playing but I knew yeah. that I couldn't keep playing again if it was my right leg I would have just kept playing but I couldn't keep playing with the uncertainty of my kicking was my biggest tool I had to goal kick I had to come up with the right plays I couldn't you know go out there and not feel my foot from week to week I had the surgery um, yeah, probably disagreed with the coaching staff at the time. Again, you know, whether they thought I was soft or whatever, but uh, the disc had shown that it was pushing up against my nerve, uh, which wasn't able to let me function how I wanted to function. And it was going to, you know, it's, it's not only playing, you got training, you got all that kind of stuff to be able to get yourself ready. 
I go in, have the surgery, shave it down, and about three or four days later, I'm pretty much at a Roosters game leaning on my side and they're like, you know, we'll get you back in the gym uh, next week. And I was, I was five days post-surgery. Um, I felt like something was wrong and rang my mate and he took me to the doctors and the disc had slipped out again. So I had to go back in again uh, and then push. And the club was throwing it to the end of the gym. Bloody hell. Yeah. It was, it was a bit of a mental headspace for me, but um, I think I pushed and played, you know, maybe 10 or eight weeks later. Uh, really pushed hard to try and get back because the team was struggling. Wallace had been injured and we just tried to get back out in the field. You know, fast forward, the rest of that season's a write-off. Again, yeah. to be dealing with divorce and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I meet my wife at the end of the year, yeah. my new wife at the end of the year and get myself real super fit in pre-season. Uh, and then, you know, I think a week before Christmas, uh, the, the disc had slipped out again. So um, I had to go back in again and, yeah, I think I played eight weeks after that, uh, maybe less, um, up in Papua New Guinea. But, yeah, it was – I wouldn't say, yeah. You know, I mean, players always want to get back and play, but probably yeah. it wasn't looked after as much as what, um, you know, I would like to have been um, because of whatever the reputation was or whatever they were going through at the time. But, yeah, I'm pretty disappointed looking back because I've had back pain – ever since I retired and you know, it's gone into my neck and stuff like that. And that's, that's footy, but yeah, it's, um, it's hard to swallow knowing that you know, I got pushed back pretty quickly because they thought I was soft or, you know, they didn't think it was a serious injury because your back's one of your most important things. Mm. I've only got two more footy questions. So I'm really interested to see what you're doing um, now. Yeah. Um, with regards to Penrith, best player, or best teammate, um, regardless of whether it was on field, <laughs> off field, best yeah. bloke to uh, hang with. James Seguiaro was always a blast. There was always something going on <laughs> in Chico's life. Um, you know, he's always had a, had a laugh. But that, that 2014 team, you know, you look at back, Josh Mansell played for Australia. Um, Matt Moreland played, I think he played for Australia or played in State of Origin a year State later. Origin, but yeah. he, um, Moisa, you know, he was class, you know, fully fit. The right situation, right time. He's um, you know, probably one of the, the, the best guy that was in the best form throughout that, that sort of period. Yeah, cool. And um, I guess the word, uh, the question gets thrown around a lot, like best, uh, I'm just going to bring something up on my screen here, best player um, you've played against. And you've been asked a similar question that before, and I just want to give you back your answer, see if you remember this. I think this is an interview with NRL. And um, so it's the best you came up against. And this is from you. So when I made my debut against Queensland in 2011, I ran out for my first <laughs> game at Suncorp Stadium and I was shooting myself. The game was on the line. It was 12-10 and I looked up and I watched the ball go from Cameron Smith to Jonathan Thurston to Darren Lockyer to Greg Inglis who passed it inside to Billy Slater and then linked that with Cooper Croc. <laughs> Does that pretty much answer the, <laughs> that yeah, pretty much uh, answer the question of the best player you've played was- against? <laughs> yeah, that wasn't the play. Um, the play, yeah, the play was Slater. We kick down. Slater gets the ball, runs it back. I think Gi has a carry. Thurston shifts to Lockyer. This is the whole set. And then anyway, they cronks on the field and they pass the ball to Lockyer. We pass it inside to Slater to score the winning try. But you know, it looked back and uh, you think about the best players you've played against and. At the time, to lose that series two one is quite an achievement. Yeah, <laughs> that's the one thing I like, see. Yeah. The, yeah, we thought we'd get yeah. three three and O's in that, but um, well, I don't yeah, think any I Origin think... series is an easy three and O. But no. I was lucky enough, or well, unlucky enough, to play in Lockie's last ever Origin game and last ever game for Brisbane. So there's a nice little bit of trivia. Did not know that. Well, that um, I'm just having a look. I think that's all pretty much the footy questions we had. So, oh no, one more. Indigenous All-Stars, you were there for the inaugural game. Mm. You get to represent your people and their culture um, and just seeing what it's morphed into. What One, how was that experience? And two, how do you like how it's morphed into with the um, Aboriginal All-Stars and the Maori All-Stars? Because I freaking love that match earlier this year with the tribalism at the start and the pride. So going from yeah, the All-Stars to the sorry, the non-Indigenous All-Stars to Maori versus Aboriginal. Yeah. I think the mix right now is perfect. Yeah. Um, you know, 
for me personally, I'd like it a week later. I think that if everyone had a trial with their team, uh, it's probably easier to take because it's such an intensity. It's such an intense week that, um, yeah, if they'd had 40 minutes under their belt, we'd probably see a better game um, in terms of skill wise. Yeah. You know, the intensity is always going to be there. The emotions always going to be there, but um, yeah, you're sort of watching it, enjoying the game as, as hyped as you can be, but realizing that I hope anyone, I hope no one gets injured. Yeah. You know, I hope everyone's ready to go. So that, that for me, I think should be a week later. Um, being a part of three of those games, you know, there was a couple of special moments. I mean, I was sort of, a young kid, a young man, when I played in that first one, I roomed with Jonathan Thurston, which was outstanding. Oh, man. Um, yeah, got to see how he worked on and off the field, you know, picked his brain a little bit. And, yeah, that was at the start of 09, I think. Um, it was like Preston one. Campbell's big. Yeah, it was, it was his idea. Well, I actually played yeah. with Presto. I was pretty lucky because I played with um, Presto in the 08 World Cup um, show, showpiece against the Maldives. And roomed with him, and and so I was a part of the inaugural inaugural team. Yeah, I mean, KT and the rest of the boys were playing for Australia, but yeah, you know, we were part of that, and uh, we've realised it was something special. So to be a part of those clashes is is always amazing. I think the last one uh, for me in 2016 was probably my most memorable, knowing that it was going to be my last time being called into the squad and a lot older and knew my career was coming to an end and to be able to go out there and perform uh, on the, on that big stage again was great but it's such a an emotional connection to not only the community and the tribalism as you mentioned but to yourself you know, yeah and to to be in that group with a for me a, a you know a bunch of black fellas that just love playing <laughs> footy and, and having a laugh for the whole week it's it's certainly a memorable experience I love it. It's something I look forward to every year. And I, I agree with you. I think the balance that it is now is is perfect. It, it was and then the and the women's game as well was brutal. It was mm. um so moving on to um post footy. So you met your now wife. Is it Mia? Yep. Sorry? Mia? Is that how you pronounce Maddie. it? Maddie. Maddie, sorry. <laughs> I, I'm getting I'm getting them mixed up with Indy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, my bad, guys. All good. Your first job afterwards was selling bathroom fittings. Yeah, selling shitters. Selling um, shitters. I, I was going to put yeah. a nice spin on it, but anyway. <laughs> it's a good story. Um, yeah, so Maddie's uh, my wife, Indiana's. She's uh, two this year, so... Uh, yeah, yeah. Maddie's worked at Harvey Norman for nearly ten years uh, in the commercial, I guess, offices. You know, the corporate offices, and I'd sort of sat around and not really done much in retirement. And she mentioned that she could get me a job in bathrooms, and it was the best job because um, I had a really great boss who didn't expect me. You know, when she sort of took me on as a bit of a favour to Maddie, and yeah. didn't know what to expect, and uh, I was keen to to learn and and sell things because obviously there's a commission, but at the end of the day, you know, there was people there that their livelihood depended on making sales. And I was more there just to, I, I um, self put myself in a position to be the, the morale booster for the whole store. So, um, you know, I'd go out the back and talk to the, to the gear guys and yeah. you know, all the people in the warehouse. I'd go up and talk to bedrooms. And then if someone needed help, I'd always greet them as they come in. So I just enjoyed um, that time, you know, person giving me a job uh, out there at Penrith and people couldn't realise why I wasn't at training. They didn't realise I'd retired because uh, I sort of just <laughs> put it quietly and moved on. So you know, people would say, oh, you're playing this year. How come you're not at training? And I, I just said, you know, I'm, I'm selling. Um, I'm just here working now. And I think uh, it really, well, it was funny because once I did that, I wanted to work in the media and I sort of hadn't had many leads, but it was like, I got reward for going out and getting a job. And once I'd worked, I mean, I worked a whole year. And once I took that job, I started getting media uh, opportunities. And I did both. You know, I did all of them for a long time. So, um, you know, I was very grateful that, you know, Maddie got me the job. But it's, it's, it's great selling shitters to 60-year-olds who don't want to spend a lot of money. So I just enjoyed the convo, mate. It was, yeah. um, like I said, very humbling and, yeah, great experience. From there, you... And you've mentioned a few times you want to get into media and you've done some commentary 2017. You started at Fox Sports. You've done some commentary with 2GB, who I believe you're still with, um, doing some Canterbury Cup sort of commentating. 
couple of questions. Is it hard to commentate coming from an ex-player or is there still training and practice involved? Um, how did you find commentating? Um, yeah, so I, I got an opportunity. I, I love listening to you on the radio. I think it's one <laughs> hilarious because you, you you're straight down the line. Um, and there's, it seems like there's times where you've held yourself back going, oh, that was a shit play. And then having yeah. to go to, that's not what could have been done in that situation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you don't, I mean, you get told you don't want to um, be negative. You want both sides because you're not just commentating for one side of fans. Uh, you, you're commentating for three, the neutral who loves footy and, the, and obviously the other the sides. But I got an opportunity at Fox. I was doing a little bit at Fox. Um, yeah, I'd been working there. Bill and Boz, you know, that sort of, I had two parts. I had my commentary dream where I wanted to get into calling games, you know, being the colour. And then I was doing the media stuff because I love all sports, American yeah. sports and stuff like that. So I uh, got real opportunity at the 2018. Yeah, Joel Kane. Um, had offered me to come across the Channel 9 and do the Canterbury Cup. And I really enjoy that because, uh, like you said, I can be myself. There's only yeah. one other person to go to. I can be a little bit, you know, off-centre if I want to be. but And I can also um, have a bit of fun. So I, I enjoy that next crop of talent coming through. And, you know, it's a nice little crew on a Sunday afternoon. We can just get, get in and out and call the footy and have fun. Uh, 2GB was big for me because I'd grown up listening to that. I uh, yeah. worked at Triple M for nearly four years on and off and getting the call up here or there and, and part-time. But for me, it was like a real uh, proud achievement to to get the call from 2GB because they've been the leader in rugby league coverage for so long that um, you know those guys are some of the greatest to ever be a part of broadcasting. Mm, definitely. So to get that opportunity and to be back this year, although it's been short, you know, in my second year, it's... Uh, it's pretty cool. So um, is it hard to commentate? I think if you, I got told when I was 19, I only did one media training session. If I can capture your attention in 10 seconds, I've, I've pretty much got you. So you know, yeah. uh, if and I'm enjoy. talking shit, you know, or, and I lose you, then that's, that's how that's, you know, you, you can't keep longevity yeah. in the game. So I've just tried to do that across all my platforms that I do and whatever I do, I try and cap, capture your attention in the first 10 seconds and, Hopefully that, that translates to when I'm talking footy and I think not taking yourself too serious. You know, you've got to have a balance. There's a lot of people that are serious in the media and great analysts and tactically way smarter than I'll ever be. Uh, then there's funnier guys that'll be funnier than I ever be. But I like to just group myself you know, right in the middle there and have a bit of both. And the I think balance. That's, yeah, I think that creates a different uh, look at how people can listen to my stuff or view my stuff. And I'm like I said, you know, I'm not, under any illusions that people aren't going to listen to me and, and don't like listening to me, but you know, people don't like listening to Ray Warren and, and some of the greats of the game. So mm. um, I just think that if I can just group myself in the middle there, have fun while I'm doing it. Uh, hopefully what I'm talking about comes out. Um, only got a couple more. Uh, Fox sports going on the back page. So this is like one mm. of the few sports shows. Like that's pretty much all I watch on TV sport. And this is one yeah. of the shows that my wife, loves watching and we loved it when you were on there you're one of the best regular guests to come on and Kerry O'Keefe before he became a um, more permanent member on there anytime you guys were coming on especially when you're both on at the same time it was freaking hilarious <laughs> and um, especially with Kelly Underwood how she's trying to bring everything back so serious and so blah blah yeah. blah and, and the rest of it was going off what was what was that crew like to work with and um the only time I ever saw you serious on there is when you were talking about the Celtics and the NBA. And uh, <laughs> that's something we're going to finish on. But best, best moment from work on Backpage. Because it's freaking um, hilarious sometimes. Yeah, it's a shame because obviously, you know, the last two years they've got a, a huge media team there. So the mm. opportunities on Backpage, they don't need outside talent. So they'd rather get people on that they've got on the books, which is, you know, smart financially. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, I really enjoyed doing that show because I've become really good friends with Tony Squires and you know, Kelly so and Crash. One of the best uh, they're, all, they're all so good. So um, working with Fitz, he was great. Uh, he was always funny. And, oh, yes. Uh, he, he, when you two were his on. one-liners were, oh. were outstanding. But um, Kerry O'Keefe was probably my highlight. Um, I'd introduce myself to him because I don't take for granted that anyone might not know who I am now. Yeah. Uh, you know, Kerry's a massive Dragons fan, so he knew 
who I was, but I just, um, I went up to him and there was two moments I said to Kerry, um, G'day Kerry, uh, it's, I'm James Howard, nice to meet you. He goes, I know who you are, young man. And I said, oh, okay. And he starts rattling off my stats. And I was like, oh, he goes, yeah, six from seven grand final and this how many points and blah, 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 blah. blah. And I was like, oh, okay, um, nice to meet you. Uh, like I was just in awe that he even knew who I was, let alone my stats. Uh, the other time was um, with Tony. He'd been begging me to bring in the grand final ring and I brought it in one night and um, took it off pre-show and we're having the meeting and stuff like that and he's wearing it around and he's strutting around the office and he's showing everyone. And I just, I left it. I just thought, well, he's going to give it back to me before the show starts. No so way. Wear it. And um, he's walking around. And anyway, we get ready. We go out on the thing. And about 30 seconds before we go on air, we're all sitting there laughing and stuff like that. And I just looked across. And I didn't want to be rude. And I just said, hey, Tone, um, do you, are you going to wear that for the show? And he said, I can't get it off. <laughs> he goes, I cannot get it off. So, yes, I am wearing it. For, he goes, I've been crying for half an hour. I can't get it off. My finger's swollen up. So uh, he wore it for the show. And then at the end, he had to yeah, get a little bit of uh, water and stuff like that and try and get it off. And he did. But, yeah, he, he, he oh, go back classic. and on that show. He, he wears it for the whole show. So, uh, but great people. Uh, really happy to have uh, had a little bit of time and, and shared with them because I really enjoyed that show. And um, we're going to finish on your new podcast and pretty much from everything you've said, it, the name of it obviously links with your last name, but it kind of represents your career as well, sweet and soured. So yeah, you've had as much as anyone, positive and negative parts of your career. And you said it's kicked off 2020 um, yep. and you work with Nick Davis, ex Sydney Swans uh, player. And it's about, introducing i guess american sport culture to australians who may not be um i'm aware is not the right word but uh knowledgeable about it what their yeah. culture's like um how have you been finding it fun you did yeah, it um, in front of a live audience is that right um no we did the first one in front of a live audience uh we've got you know four or five sponsors on board that have been great in terms of you know giving us some money to get equipment and stuff like that yeah. which is why i can do podcasts from my home now and I've yeah. learned how to do that. So, um, yeah, it was, I mean, it started off like that. The, the sporting landscape's changed the last two months because we haven't had much yeah, to talk about. So we've more or less been talking about NRL and, uh, we did a chocolate knockout. We did, we, I think we're going to do beers next, but, um, yeah, I think trying to introduce American sport culture to Australia is important because one, you know, pretty much everyone, all the suits, they will gamble on it. Um, so you're going to get an easy listening audience there, yeah. but you know, everyone has a basketball singlet or, or have seen LeBron James and, and whatever else. So uh, just in, introducing that the fact that not everyone has to be that great guy that they can, you know, look at the American sports landscape. And yeah, you know, obviously it's hard at the moment. We're talking a lot about other stuff and we've got a few characters on the show, but I, I just wanted to start a show every night, every Tuesday night to be able to do and, talk with a couple of mates and you know i went into business and registered the sweet and sour business name and you know hopefully start doing functions and all that kind of stuff but um i just wanted an opportunity to really get together with some guys that i'd worked with in the in the past and yeah. still do and come up with ideas to be able to have fun and and realize sort of make people uh, aware of what's going on and, and my opinion you know i work so hard during the NRL season to give so many serious opinions about yeah. X's and O's that it's nice to have a little bit of fun and take the piss. And, and it's been good. Uh, like I said, the last month and a bit, has been a bit challenging because we're coming up with different ways and we've been interviewing, you know, you mentioned Kyle Flenny and we did Kyle last week. We did Chad Townsend. We've done Dean Young, uh, Cameron King, and we did Sammy Bremner um, the other day. So it's about getting those out and, it gives, I think, gives. It's right now is the opportunity to get interviews done because everyone's yeah. looking for an opportunity to do something. But uh, I, I enjoy it. I think, uh, you know, it's it's nice to see everyone coming up with content and, and enjoying it and the interaction. Like I said, as long as you do it respectfully, I'll always interact with with people. But um, you know, sometimes you get a little bit hairy. But that's yeah. that's you know, that's why I love Twitter because I can say whatever I want. <laughs> that's a, that's pretty much how Jared and I started. We just used to chat NRL and. There was stuff that the media or the broadcast partners never talked about. Now we figured they were too nice sometimes to teams. They were too complimentary sometimes. They're giving other teams heart, but never going into 
analytical reasons why rather than it's just what they were saying yeah. and and we started doing that and then like so i'm a big american sports fan as well i subscribed to the athletic and looking at all their yeah. articles that are coming out and they're scrambling and they're in such a worse um they're doing so much worse than we are there's oh, how long yeah. it's going to be till sports over there it's amazing to see what they're talking about and um talking about how big a fan you are you prepare Proposed to your wife at TD Garden, is that right? Yeah. Your daughter's yeah, named uh, Indy after the state bird. Is that also yeah. right? It's um. So I I actually proposed in Australia, so the ring was insured. Um, oh, okay. But, um. Yeah. Ended up. I thought we were just getting a photo, and the lady took us down on Centre Court. So uh, we've reenacted that one on Centre Court of, of TD Garden. Oh, uh, cool. Night, yeah. 2017. Um. I went back and watched Paul Pierce raise his jersey banner. to the banner with my, with my best mate i've got the postcode tattooed on my ass inside a little clover um <laughs> yeah indiana so larry bird was born in in the state of indiana french lick indiana and um he's your favorite player yeah, so he's my favorite player i've yeah. got his number tattooed number three uh, on the back of his arm yeah. 33 on 33 each arm. sorry yeah and then uh yeah i met paul pierce last year he came out and um yeah it was doing the thing to through with Jonathan Thurston and I was lucky enough I had to help host and they got me a gig there so he uh, put a signature on me left cheek above the postcode and I went and got it tattooed on me so uh, <laughs> that is brilliant I'm a, I'm a diehard diehard Celtics fan and um, yeah Indiana and Maddie didn't have a choice so it's great because Maddie's um, we're obviously Kings fans as well but uh, Sydney Kings fans, but Maddie's right into the Celtics, so oh, okay. um, we, only, we we don't have any other teams or jerseys or anything like that. We're strictly Celtics in this house. Are you straight? And you straight down NBA? Do you give the other guys uh, other sports a, um, a look as well? Yeah, so obviously Red Sox. Uh, and the, so you're all all, all the Boston sort of. Uh, yeah, no? Bruins only because I've been to a game. Bruins, I've, obviously, like, but I'll, I've always, uh, you know, for. 10 12 years since Katrina, I've always liked Drew Brees, so I've been going for New Orleans. Yeah. Uh, I just like the fact that he was a little guy and the way he held himself and, and competed and got the big plays done. So, yeah, I'm a bit of a sports fanatic. Um, I don't know, probably my last thing in college, I don't know why I go for Oklahoma, but I've always had a soft spot for Oklahoma. Are they Sooners. the Sooners? Yeah. Um, yeah, the Sooners. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll pretty much watch anything. Anything that awesome. you, anyone can compete in, I'll watch anything and, and pick a song. Well, I hate three of your teams, all the Boston ones. We won't talk about them, but <laughs> it's also awesome. All right, I'm gonna, we're going to finish with just some numbers. I, wanted, I want you, if you can, tell me what these numbers mean. Uh, 398. Points I scored in 2004. No. Nah. Goals you've kicked okay. for St. George, still the highest number. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 234. Uh, goals I kicked for Penrith. Most points in a season. My most points. Mm. Uh, okay. And for St. George. 2009. Yeah, 2009. Uh, 977. Points for the Dragons. That's it. Points. I should have had a 1,000. You, you're, so you're topping three um, all-time stats for one of the net like most storied franchises that's a something pretty cool to have in the history uh, gareth would have almost caught you on goals so lucky you retired otherwise you wouldn't have had that one <laughs> and 22 points in a match is still most for penrith with uh owen cleary and who's the other one no nathan cleary scored 30 nathan cleary, sorry i was just saying cleary. um maloney at at penrith so you've got a record over there as well. So, oh no, sorry, that twenty-two points that was with St George as well. Your time with yeah. um, Ben Hornby there and Gareth, uh, Roberts, Gareth Widdett. That's huge. So we've been through so much stuff there. You've given us a whole bunch of um, time. So I just want to say thank you on behalf of Jared and I and the Six Again Podcast. We're just trying to do our thing. Um, to our listeners as well, make sure you check out Sweet and Soured. It's on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Um, every, I guess, in the drops Tuesday nights. Yeah, every Wednesday. Wednesday uh, we've morning. been keeping an eye out. Yeah, we've been dropping those little ISO 15, 20 minute podcasts um, with, the, with the former players or current players as well. So they're always good fun. It's all positive. It's not about their, um, not necessarily their career. It's about some of their biggest moments. 
you know, some of their best memories. So you know, they're just good little fun podcasts that you can knock over in 20, 25 minutes. 20 minutes. That's, um, I'm definitely going to be checking that out because just for a lot of the stuff you've talked about, there's a lot of stuff that I played my career like, and it's still the, the smaller sort of get in and give it a go players are my favorites and kind of always has been. Now, Steve Menzies for Manly is definitely not the most athletic of players, but <laughs> damn, he was smart and he, he'd get in his way. Um, just to finish off, do you have a favorite player in the NRL right now? That you just love watching. I love love how they go about their game. Um, Kiri's up there. I like Kiri. Um, yeah, it's it's tough. Uh, Jack White probably took me by surprise last year. I like watching him. I like watching Hodgson. Um, there's there's a heap of guys that you sit down and watch that you can see their game develop. That they're probably, I mean, there's teams that are certainly years ahead, but that talent. Yeah, from Luke Keary, to watch him, that's why I was disappointed this year, obviously because the game stops and we're out of work, but his development without Cooper Cronk yeah. and how he would have been able to work that out, I know in two starts, so hopefully we get to see that, but if I had to pick one guy to watch, uh, it would be uh, Luke Keary. All right, cool. I'd go, I'm going with Brandon Smith from the Storm. Love, love what yeah, he does. Yeah, well, he's, I mean, he he's, I, love, I love watching him as well, but, I just probably from a tactical point of view. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I see what you're Kiri, saying. <laughs> you Kiri can't compare those two. <laughs> well, no, nah, he's just straight up and down the cheese. He won't, uh, he doesn't miss anything. All right. Thank you so much, Jamie. No worries, mate. Appreciate it. Thanks for the time. Good luck with everything you've got going on, and hopefully, we'll catch you down the track. No worries, mate. Thanks again. Jared's just shaking his head because that last um, attempt I did to get us back on didn't work as well as oh, it So It hurt my ears. He screamed in the bloody microphone. I was excited. It was a good interview. It was fun. It, um, it was a really good interview. I hope you guys really enjoyed that. Uh, we said on the pod already, that's why this episode's titled Sweet and Sour. So Jamie's got his new podcast out. Uh, jump on there and have a listen. Um, and again, thank you to Jamie for being such a awesome dude and and getting back to us and giving us a really uh in-depth interview covering almost his or pretty much his entire footy career so news from us you might have seen it already that oh hi kalisha yeah kalisha's in it now we got to come in a wave now <laughs> this is only on youtube it's all good yeah um, <laughs> she can't hear you but yeah. so we've got a, a new logo you would have seen it jumping around it's got a few different versions of it. Just want to do a huge shout out to Aaron Lotter Design. Uh, we've linked him a job. whole bunch of he, he, he was awesome. He got back to us really quick. He got it done really well and really well priced. So if you're looking at that sort of uh, design work, he does a whole bunch of other stuff. You can jump on his uh, Instagram and have a look or his website's already in the video description on this as well. Now, with everything going on, when are we doing our next show, Jared? So we're going back to two a week now. Yeah, we're going to have to. Um, we, me and Adam started this as a bit of a, you know, play around kind of thing because we both like talking about rugby league, but it has gone so much further than we thought it would. And we're really happy for all the people who supported us with it, like Aaron Lotta, my brother Billy, a few other people who have really put their hands up and helped us out. So we really appreciated that. So, yeah, we're going back to two a week now. Hopefully, before the season starts, we'll be able to set that up because we've got so much content we're ready to give you guys. Yeah. Which is really so that, great. So Outside of the interviews, we've only just been touching on some things, like all that TV yeah. stuff at the start we could have talked about for ages. So, <laughs> we're going to go back to recording on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights, dropping Monday and Thursday mornings. Um, um, and this week, um, we're going to post two more interviews this week after Soward. Hopefully. So, we'll, we'll yeah, go, hopefully. It comes together. Uh, we'll post um, a few hints on Facebook and Instagram so people will get out there and try and guess who they are, yep. which is really cool. Um, and as previously touched on, we now have Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. We're on every single platform you can imagine. Just search in the Six Again pod. You can find and we'll go from there. Yeah, so with regards to LinkedIn, that's our personal profile. Oh, yes. uh, six Again. And obviously, it's on our YouTube channel. Um, hit the subscribe button, like, share it between all your mates, and uh, we'll probably see you guys Thursday morning. Yeah, see you guys. See ya. <laughs>